Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Zechariah, meaning remembered of Yah. He's coming back. He remembers us. And this is his um, word concerning that time just before he does return. So this makes it a very interesting book. As I've said, you could teach all the Bible from this one book, Zechariah, before it covers from beginning to end and how fantastic it is. We come to chapter 4 <clears throat> and um, uh, the branch having been promised in the 8th verse of chapter 3 and that branch being Christ himself. And then we come to uh, the fourth chapter, verse one, and a word of wisdom from our Father, that verse one reads, and the angel that talked with me came again and walked, waked me as a man that is waking out of his sleep. In other words, this, this was an important message. He keeps handing this to Zechariah, one after the other. Verse two, and he said unto me, what seest thou, question? And I said, I have looked and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it. I want you to make note of that. The bowl is where? The bowl is on top of it. And his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Now, naturally, seven, as we've had the seven eyes in the prior chapters, uh, chapter two, symbolic of God's election, that rock that had seven pairs of eyes. And here we have again this seven lampstand, seven giving light. Okay. And what, what you have pictured here is a menorah. Okay. But it's important that you note where the oil comes from. And that from that reservoir, there is a line or a pipe to each of those lights. Now, naturally, let's, let's talk about this a moment. What is a light for the Lord? It's somebody that reflects His Word. But you have to remember that Word always comes not from man, but it comes from the Lord. Otherwise, it will not stand. It will not last. It will not be true necessarily unless it does come from the Lord. And that's what this is symbolic of. But also that um, bowl which would carry the oil of our people. Let's go with what kind of oil are we talking about? Verse 3. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. The olive trees were where they were one on each side of the bowl. That is to say the bowl that holds the oil. So naturally, we know we're talking about olive oil here, the oil of our people. The olive tree itself, how do you say it in the Hebrew tongue? el Yah. That's the name of God, a title, and His sacred name, the oil of our people. Many Christians say, well, I, I, Christians don't have to anoint. Christians do not anoint. Well, what do you think Christ means? Christ means the anointed one. The etymology of the word Christ even comes from rubbing as though anointing. So it's very important that you understand that, that our Father knows, our Father understands, and our Father gives us specific instructions as to what you should draw light from, who you should draw light from, so that you are guaranteed in your own mind it's a truth. And naturally, that comes from our Father. Um, many things, many scriptures are based upon that oil. The ten virgins, five had their bowls of their lamps full. 
and, and which that is symbolic of the truth, the Word of God that flows from God, and they were equipped. But five of them, they were slough-offs. They had nothing, and they had to beg to try to get some oil, and uh, naturally, they had no Eliyah, which is to say, they didn't have God. And be honest about it, they did not have God, God's Word. And without that word, you are kind of a lost soul. The word of God strengthens. The word of God brings his blessings. And that oil is so symbolic and useful in a Christian's life. Even in healing, you anoint, as it is written in James chapter 5, you call the elders and you anoint with olive oil the sick and then pray that they are healed that Christ will heal them. The oil doesn't do it, but it is your obedience to use that oil, which is, produces in this case, here in this uh, fourth chapter, light. And that light, of course, bringing truth. What a fantastic picture we see here. Okay, verse uh, four to continue. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? What, what, what is this that's standing before me here? Verse 5, And then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. You know, there are many times that Christ would answer likewise, because it's kind of like, Haven't you read? Don't you understand what's before you? Can't you see it? I mean, it's really, it's a very obvious picture to one that is enlightened, okay, with the Word of God. Verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord. It is what? It is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. And what is said here? What, what, what does Zerubbabel, we've, we've been with him here through Haggai in this particular book. What, what does it mean? What does his name mean? It means born in Babel, born in confusion, but he came out. You know, blessed be God, we were all in that state of confusion at one time. By that I mean not having the full truth, the Word of God with understanding. And uh, what he's saying here is that um, the, the, what was before him was these, this oil was the spirit of the very Word of God. And you would think because the bowl was on top that it would flow by gravity. Not so. Not so. But by the Spirit of Almighty God. That is to say the Holy Spirit, that is the Spirit of God, is the Holy Spirit, flows through those pipes to each light and brings us the truth from Almighty God. That that God would have us know, that that God would have us understanding, uh, to understand, that brings us out of confusion, that's to say Babel, Zerubbabel, that, and brings you into that beautiful light and not only brings you into that light, but when you produce that light, it reflects out and helps others. It's a beautiful thing. When you think of the true Word of God, you can't contain it. You can't hold it within yourself. That's to say like giving a truth and hiding it under a bushel. You can't hide it. It bursts forth. You can't help but share it, that beautiful truth. And here, Zerubbabel, who has been so helpful in bringing that truth forward, stands. He that had that rock with the seven eyes, born in Babel, no, no need to apologize for that, but to come out of it, come out of confusion. Verse 7, to continue. Who art thou, O great mountain? Who is this great nation and mountain that <clears throat> before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. In other words, when, when the Spirit of God finishes with it, there won't be a mountain, it'll be a plain. 
and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Now, visualize the pyramid, if you would, without the capstone upon it. The capstone is symbolic, of, and the headstone is Christ. It is the stone that the builders rejected, and it is the stone that shall crush many by not having the truth. It is the stone that many, believing in Christ and loving Christ, will worship the false Christ. Why? They haven't studied the oil of our people, the truth that flows from and Almighty God through the Spirit of God through those pipes into that stand, bringing us the honest, straightforward Word of God, whereby we can see clearly the very actions of Satan, the troubles of the world, and giving us the simple truth, knowing who the capstone is. It's the branch that was promised in the prior chapter, and the branch, of course, being the Lord Jesus Christ. That headstone is remembered of Yah. This is a beautiful book, remembered of God, that He's coming back. That capstone is coming back first to put things in order. The headstone. And, uh, and the sad part is that many people believing upon Christ do not realize that the false Christ is returning first. That's why the real lights stand supposed to try to drag people out of the grips of Satan right up to the very last breath, that um, the very last moment better spoken, that to save people from that deception, that worshiping the false one, that uh, they be not uh, back in Babel and be old sister Babel. That's not a good place to be. But many will be there because they have no understanding. Verse 8, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Saying what? Verse 9, let's say, read it. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. In other words, Zerubbabel. Remember in, the, in Haggai where he said, is your seed still in the barn or have you broadcast it? Have you planted it so that that seed can sprout, so that that truth can come forward? And, um, and so it is. He said, this one has started that house of many members and he's going to finish it. Okay. <clears throat> that does not make him special does not make him anything special because he's symbolic of those that come out of confusion. Where is it then that we should look and apply the respect to the head of the pipe, the head of the bowl from which that oil flows, not by gravity, but by the very Spirit of Almighty God, which is to say the Holy Spirit, bringing truth into the minds of the people that would see that light that would behold that light, that would take part in respecting that light and loving that light. <clears throat> it's a very special light. It's not a light made by man. It's a light that comes from Almighty God. There is no substitute and there's nothing else like it. Verse 10, for who hath despised the days of small things? Question. You know, people, but, well, how could we do that? Well, we really couldn't, but if you've got God on your side, nothing is impossible. There are many things impossible for man, but if God is with you, nothing is impossible. So don't think small. For they shall rejoice. Should. They've got plenty to rejoice about and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, with seven what? Well, the plummet is the stone and it's the seven pair of eyes. That's God's elect, okay? In the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. That's their purpose, is to take the very word of God and plant it, let it grow 
to seed plant everywhere the truth of God's Word. Now, many people perhaps do, do, uh, would not know what a plummet was. It's a plumb bob. Okay. In other words, I want you to get this picture real good. The 7,000, that stone, that plummet, that has the seven pairs of eyes, meaning God's election, <clears throat> a plumb bob is on the end of a string. And in building that house for God, it keeps things straight. Okay. The 7,000 keep the truth straight. In the hand of Zerubbabel, teaching that word of God, whereby it is plumb square and level. I mean, it is right to the line. The master builder being the director thereof, Almighty God. But that plummet, that plumb bob, their purpose their purpose is keeping the Word of God straight and accurate and taking it, if you would, exploding it to the world, that the world, those that would have eyes to see or ears to hear, could learn of that truth, the remembering of Almighty God, His return, how He returns, the events that consummate the end of this age whereby you are not deceived, knowing and understanding the very actions of God that you are blessed because you're plugged into that pipeline, that light, and it reflects from you. You get salty whereby you change the flavor of boredom, of non-truth, of half-truth, and keep it straight right on that plumb bob. That's what God's 7,000 do. Seven is in Hebrew numerics means spiritual completeness. And that's exactly what it is. It brings about spiritual completeness as far as the truth of God's Word is concerned. Not by man's word, not by man's mouth, not by man's mind, but by the Spirit of God flowing that oil of truth God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is Almighty God, His voice that speaks and His voice that carries forth that very oil um, in that lamp. Uh, and um, I, I would read again, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, which of course is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit blesses the Holy Spirit is always with us. God, that's why God can say without um, any uh, reservation, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you as long as you want Him with you, as long as you want that Spirit, as long as you want that flow of truth coming from His Word, His blessings, then He is with you. Always holding that plumb bob, Zerubbabel is, keeping it straight and level. That's to say focused. Don't, don't be one of these people that is easily distracted by the things of the world. Okay. But staying focused on the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Well, But I like to get into things that are exciting. You don't find anything more exciting than the Word of God taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Uh, reiterating the very events as they transpire consummating the end of this age. It doesn't get any better than that. Okay. <clears throat> All by the Spirit of God. Verse 11, Then answered I, and I said unto him, What are these two olive trees? Upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof. What, what are these trees standing here? And uh, naturally they supplied... God through them supplied the oil that went through the stems. Okay. Verse 12. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Where does it come from? Out of of themselves. These two trees, these two olive trees, and naturally we know we're speaking here of the two witnesses. 
that God, just at the very end, this, there's a time period on this. We know when that time is. It's the time of the two witnesses. Just it, during the five months period mentioned in Revelation chapter 9, just before that great day, and God is so good to us that he sends and allows these two. But what happens? What, what is their purpose? That the oil can flow from and through them. And what is the oil again? Don't ever forget it. Don't worship the trees. It is the Spirit of God. Worship God only. But appreciate where it comes from. Okay. The oil that flows from them. The oil of our people, Eliyah, that beautiful oil. But he asked this two times for emphasis. He truly didn't know. Okay. Verse 13, and he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? You don't know? And I said, No, my Lord. Verse 14, then he said, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. They stand by who? They stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Not way away from Him. When they are here, He is basically here. He is by them. Spiritually, of course. But He is by them. Now, in the Hebrew, do you know what these two are called? Many of your um, companion Bibles will say sons of oil. Okay, sons of what oil? Of our of the oil of our people, of course. And that oil is ever so important, bringing forth the anointed one. Well, who is the anointed one? Messiah, of course. Christ, Christos, meaning the anointed one. How beautiful it is when we put the whole thing together and we see that God always remembers his people. If you want to listen, always leads his people if you want to be led. Always teaches his people if you want to be taught because he sends those helps that are ever, ever so blessed. You know, these, there is no gender in these two. But, and most people believe, uh, who, who were the two that showed up with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? And it was to, to be kept secret until after the crucifixion and the, res, to the, the resurrection. It was Moses and Elijah. Moses being of the law and Elijah being the prophets. And the law and the prophets bring forth all the oil, the truth of our people. Many people think, well, possibly it's um, Enoch uh, because he didn't die. Well, it could be. That we don't know, and it doesn't matter because it is those two that are the oil of our people. They, they never died, and they were certainly. And, of course, it speaks of this in the New Testament as well. And, and I'm going to just read a few verses because what that plumb bob brings forth that the 7,000 hold true. They must be aware of those two olive trees. And it's not just Old Testament material. That's what some ministers would tell you. But it's future yet. And it has to do with our people. Chapter 11, the great book of Revelation, you're not going to have it, but listen to me. Verse 3. Uh, after he had measured this house of God, verse 3 of chapter 11, the great book of Revelation, and it reads, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. That, that, that means it's, it's, um, uh, they are given these prophecies and the prophecies pertaining to them is in deus, which is to say days, not moons, not night. That's always of Satan. But this is days, children of light, that these two, and of course we know that time has been shortened just as the five-month period in Revelation chapter 9. These are the two olive trees. You want to know who they are? These are the two olive trees, verse 4, 
and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Those candlesticks that we just covered in the great book of Zechariah remembered of Yah, chapter 4. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They don't, they don't uh, put up with any malarkey. Okay. In other words, they're on a mission from Almighty God. Satan that, that will be on earth at that time as the false Christ. And, um, uh, in, and of course, what is the fire of God? It's a consuming fire. And what comes from their mouth will blister. Truth always hurts. Okay. If, if you're out of step with Almighty God. Verse 6, They have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. They have that authority and that power. You know, um, this is God's power being exercised by these two to document to those non-believers that God's still on the throne and that His great day is just approaching. And so it is that our Father is in control, that our Father is always in control. Verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. These two witnesses never died, but they will be killed where? Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was our Lord crucified? Jerusalem. That's where it's going to take place. Why? Because that's where he out of the bottomless pit, that's to say the Antichrist, will ascend from. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. You know why? They had all these miraculous uh, powers, and the people want to make sure that they don't resurrect. They're going to leave their bodies right out in the open. Not going to put them in a tomb this time going to leave them right out there where we can all see them and we're going to party and make sure they don't resurrect in three and a half days. Okay. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. They're going to party. And shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. I mean, they thought Messiah was with them. Good people. Good church people worshiping the false Messiah, and they think these two freaks come along and, and disturb their little path, they're going to see that God's not going to raise them. What happens, though? 11, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. It had better because this is the return of Christ. Three and a half days when the two witnesses die in the streets of Jerusalem, Christ shall return. When that event transpires, you don't have to wonder when the end will be. If you're a student of God's Word, you will know. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. They, you bet they will. And to be an enemy of those two means you're hell bound unless there's a great change. So our Father gives us many blessings. Our Father sends us truth, the oil of our people, that oil of our people symbolizing His Word, the very Word of God that moves that truth into the minds of people, shedding that light whereby you're never in darkness that Satan can overshadow you and put you in darkness.
but that light lights your very soul whereby you, you um, make a difference in people's lives. That's the whole point, is to save God's children, to give them that truth, to give them that light in the simplicity in which Christ taught it. Returning to the great book of Zechariah, let's come to chapter 5. Let's take a verse or two of it. What does it say? Verse, chapter 5, verse 1. Then I turned and I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. I mean, there is a sign coming here. It is big. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. That sign is 30 by 15. Anybody could see it. That's how plain God's Word is if you look, beloved, if you pay attention. It's very interesting what's on that sign and the very curse that can come upon the people that will not observe that sign. And it, it is a, a very important sign. Verse 3, Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. How much, how much of the earth was that? Did it go? The whole earth, all of it. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off, as on that side according to it. Sweareth by what? Sweareth by the false Christ. And everyone that steals a heritage, that is to say, to steal a birthright, the very inheritance of Almighty God to His own children, anyone that messes with that, teaching falsely, leading falsely, is going to partake of the curse. Next lecture, next lecture we'll cover what that curse covers just a little bit of. All right. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves. You got a, a, a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question pertaining to a particular reverend or denomination, or organization. Let's don't judge people. Let God be the, the judge. And he certainly is. Okay, now, That's why his word is so beautiful, so to the point. And he, he is that judge. Okay, Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. And um, it's good to hear from you. And you got a prayer request, you don't need the number, and you don't need the address. Why, God knows what you're thinking. You're his child. You know, he, he's never made anyone else like you. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique. But he wants you to love him. He loves you, but he may not love what you're doing. So let him know that you do love him. Follow his word. Won't you do that? by staying in His Word. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that You lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank You, Father. Amen. Okay, and we'll get into some questions here. And first, we've got Gary from Texas. What do you think the 
stimulus package should be spent on first? Well, you know, you know it would be common sense. W what is it that we need? You know, we're spending $700 billion a year to import oil. Now, a lot of people think you can put a wind charger. We've had wind chargers in Texas and Oklahoma since I was a small boy before we even had uh, power lines. They will not produce the juice, okay? Will not. Waste of time. What we need to do is to spend that $800 billion building 26 atomic energy plants to produce power for this nation and to drill baby drill. I mean drill offshore, drill in Alaska, produce our own oil, and the very first year we would get our uh, stimulus package all back and keep it home. But you know, that would be common sense. I don't think that there's any common sense in Washington, D.C. I don't think they can even see that. So, you know, so what will they do? They'll hanky-panky and go around here and, and a bunch of novices and beginners trying to make wind chargers and solar, you know. It, it, you know, this will not drive our jets, fighter planes. It will not drive our ships. And we're at war, two wars. We need to protect our nation. And it's not time to play gimmicks or play with gimmicks when common sense and experience in developing energy, we've got it, okay? We've always been great in developing energy. Just get out there and get to it and stop listening to a bunch of yo-yos that absolutely have no conception of what they're doing. It, it just, you know, the great book of Isaiah is, is an interesting book, and our Father sees things so far in advance. And in chapter 3 of the great book of Isaiah, he says, uh, uh, verse 4, and I will, this chapter 3, verse 4, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. They'll be their presidents and vice presidents. Minds of babes, okay? And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. And a child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. And so it is. What would I do with it? Build power. You know, if, if we've got a sure hand to play. We spend $700 billion a year on foreign energy when we've got it right here at home. All, you know, in building 26 nuclear plants, it would put enough people to work that there would be no unemployment in this nation and our problems would be over and our enemy would be sucking their thumbs, wondering, well, what did they do? We did what was common sense, under God, for God, by God, saved the nation. But then, you know, um, there's no common sense in Washington, D.C., so it probably will not be spent. Maybe for a bunch of uh, prophylactics, maybe a, a lot of um, some, something, you know, that would really make common sense. Is, is that common sense? Of course not. Okay. They play and fiddle while Rome burns. It would be so much better to use common sense. Well... You asked me, and I told you. Pat from California, when we die and our spiritual bodies go to heaven, how will we remember our loved ones if our brain dies when our body dies and we have no memory? I'm afraid you do not understand man's spirit. As it is written in Ecclesiastes, your spirit is your intellect. Your, the, the, your brain is only an organic uh, instrument that contains... The, the very uh, dynamic thought process of yourself that is your spirit, and it goes with you back where it came from, you know. Um, the matter that contains 
the intellect is just organic matter. Okay. You wouldn't want to take it with you. You have a far better one in the spiritual body. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Read it. Becky from Minnesota, would you please explain 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58? Well, I'd be happy to. At the last trump, we're all going to be changed into spiritual bodies. The good, bad, all of us. For what? Judgment. The many people are going to be raised, all of us will be raised in a spiritual body. That means a body that doesn't age or wither or get old. But a lot of people are still going to be raised with a mortal soul. Mortal means liable to die. In other words, they didn't overcome. And some are raised with a body that is immortal, meaning deathlessness. It won't die. Why? Because it's going to live eternally. And then Christ shows that he defeats death. The grave, where is thy sting? Um, and death has no victory. Why? Because Christ overcame it. Came it. And um, that's why you want to follow him. All right. Not the, not the propagator of death, which is to say the devil. That's his name is death. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, documentation. Steve from North Carolina. I've been hearing that we are in, a la in the latter days ever since I was a kid, and I'm 56 years old. I wanted to know what evidence in the Bible proves that we are in the latter days. Well, it's, it's real simple. This is why Christ said, don't maybe get around to learning the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn it. Because when you learn the parable of the fig tree, you know that in the year that Israel became a nation again, you were in the last generation. That did not happen from the time you were a child or anybody was a child until the year 1948 of our Lord. And naturally, well, how long is that generation? However long God wants it to. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 states he gives us 120 years. Um, Psalms 91, I think it's 91 or 2, 91, says 72 years. 70 years plus 2 or whatever. And then a generation in the wilderness was only 40 years. So uh, it's however long he chooses. But um, we're in it. And that is the documentation. You have to dig it out a little bit, and you'll find the real answer in Jeremiah chapter 24. Linda from Kentucky. Are arthritis and chronic illnesses considered medical, or can they be caused by evil spirits? Arthritis and a, and a um, chronic illness cannot be caused by a demon, okay, or an evil spirit. Cannot happen. Um, arthritis and uh, is caused because of the pollution we have in this world, the toxics that are in our systems from food to, that um, ill-prepared and so forth through chemicals that are in the air and so forth. Um, we, we do this to ourselves, and um, certainly um, so it is. But evil spirits um, get blamed for quite a few things. And certainly, uh, let, let me even add epilepsy to this, because this is where many churches just really make life miserable for people that are, have uh, epilepsy. That is not a demon. It is an illness, a birth injury, an injury sometime in life that causes it. <clears throat> and it's, there's nothing spiritual evil about it, okay? So there you go. Diane from Alabama. Psalms 21 and 22 is David speaking of Jesus in the chapters. And in Matthew, Jesus said what David said in Psalms 22. Well, it, what did David say in Psalms 22? He told of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, even down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross. Yes, Christ, I feel, repeated the whole psalm. Because the final words in the psalm are the equivalent of what he said in, in the Aramaic, which is to say, it is finished. But it um, told exactly the events that were happening at the foot of the cross, around the cross, and, and so forth. It, um, that was his words on the cross. 
the 23rd Psalm is not a psalm of death, as many people teach it, but it's the psalm of resurrection and eternal life. Uh, Lucille from Louisiana. When taking communion, should we use unleavened bread and why? Well, because leaven is symbolic, uh, biblically, of sin. And um, uh, they, naturally, on the, when, when we first partook of Passover, which was um, uh, when the night that we escaped from Egypt, then the bread didn't have time to rise. So the eleven wouldn't have done any good anyway. Okay. But what it means is it means that you leave the sin um, from the dough. Uh, and sin is like yeast. What does yeast do? Well, you make the dough, and when you put that little tad of yeast or, or, or leaven in that dough, what does it do? It goes through that whole loaf and it puffs it up. It raises it. It goes through the whole thing. And that's why our Father used it as what sin will do to a family. Okay. And a good example, and rightly said. Richard from California. I'd love for you to talk more about being a Christian and a Marine. Also, I lost my mother two days after Christmas, and I don't know how to deal with it. Can you help me? Well, she's with the Father. That's where she wanted to be. That's what every Christian looks forward to, but we must stay here as long as our Father wishes us here with something to do. But I'm sure he's already said, my good and faithful servant, well done. And uh, so um, be, be happy for her. And you're going to join back with her uh, when that seventh trump sounds. We're all going to be back together again. And... Um, uh, um, and I, I'm glad that you enjoy what, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to serve in the United States Marine Corps. I'm happy that, uh, that uh, we were able to break the back of communism in Korea and in Vietnam. And uh, it is something we want to keep off of our shores and away from us, is socialism and communism. Communism and socialism have never been successful. They've always failed. You cannot show me one nation that has survived communism, which is the big brother to socialism, and been successful. They haven't. Uh, O.J. from Arizona. A few days ago, you said Jesus will return five months after the one world government is established and three days after an event I didn't quite catch. My question is twofold. What is the second event, and how did you derive at this? Well, I derived at that because that's what the Word says. And isn't it ironic, today is the day you got your answer, because we read it in the 11th chapter of Revelation, that three and a half days after the two witnesses are murdered by the Antichrist in the streets of Jerusalem, the, the word street is really... As a student of the word, it, come in, it makes me a little uncomfortable to say street as it is translated because the word in the Greek is pata, and it means an arena where they really have a big, large opening, and, and they're celebrating, okay? And that's, that's how I can know. Well, how do you know? Because God says it. If God says it, I believe it, and that's what he says right there in that 11th chapter of Revelation. Betty from Mississippi, where in the scripture do I find let the dead bury the dead and what does it mean? Oh, one place is Matthew chapter 8 verse 22. Okay, And there was a young man who wanted to follow Christ and he said, I'd really like to go with you. And you got to remember the time and the place. Back then, they didn't have fast automobiles or railroads or airplanes. When you went out to teach the Word, you would be gone from home for months and months and months, necessarily. Okay, And it would be just dangerous traveling out there. But he said, I, I want to go with you, but first let me go back home and bury my father. Now, his father, it's a, the translation doesn't quite catch it. His father was in the process of dying. Okay, The transition may be better said of dying. I mean, it might take months. 
And this is why Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Those that are spiritually dead, let them take care of that. And you come along and help bring life. That's what he was talking about. Vanita from uh, Indiana. Um, thank you for uh, your comment on the staff. Where, in, where is it that Elijah asked God to show the man with him where their help from God was? Thank you again for your teaching um, of uh, the, the book of Kings. Well, it, it, you know, you're going to find it wasn't Elijah, okay? It was Elisha. Uh, Elijah had already gone. It was El Elisha that did this, and you'll find it. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Because God had a, a whole army, thousands of chariots right over their head. Spiritual warfare. Okay. And um, many people get all nervous about God's chariots. And they, don't, they can't quite understand that. And it is very difficult to think at other dimensions. But when... when um, Elisha knew that the army of God was there. And he did. He prayed that this helper, if God could just part the veil just a little bit. And, and, and Elisha was praying. He said, I pray, Father, that you'll part the veil so he can see our help. And man, I'm telling you, he parted that veil and that servant saw thousands of of armed chariots of God right over them and they charged and made such a noise that the enemy about killed themselves running away. Many of them did. And um, Father takes care of his own, okay? But I can understand how the little one servant when there was a whole army out there and Elisha says, saddle up, put on your armor and let's go get them. You know, that would be a little off-sided until he could see what was overhead. Jimmy from Kentucky. You're welcome. For, uh, I enjoy teaching. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came to earth, where did the dying spirit and soul go? I know Jesus was the first resurrection. Well, you know, um, we're told that in... Um, we're, we're told that in... Um, uh, First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, that when Christ was still in the tomb, he went all the way back to Noah. That is to say, a figure of speech that means all the way to the beginning. Those spirits were in paradise, and God went to, Christ went to them and gave them an opportunity to accept him. And as you read on in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, many of them did. They were freed. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 12 through 13, God says he opened their graves in the land of Israel. Uh, th this, this means he brought truth. What was Ezekiel doing to those dry, dead bodies, bones? Preaching to them. They weren't physically dead. They were spiritually dead. And the real truth, that old plumb bob held straight and true, where it is the word of God that flows brings new life into people that are spiritually dead and gives them eternal, not just life, but eternal life. That's what it's talking about. Nathan from Louisiana. Can you explain to me the great book of Revelations in chapter 17, who the woman is written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth? I sure can. It is the church that follows Antichrist. The, the sad part about her is most, she's made up mostly of what think they are good Christian people. You see, you've almost got to be a Christian to follow the Antichrist instead of Christ because they think it's him. And, and many, much of the world will wonder after him, but Christians especially, that because he, he's coming saying, I'm going to fly you out of here. This is why Christ, uh, Almighty God says in Ezekiel 13, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. Because this is where they end up at. You see, God doesn't teach that. That's a teaching of men, traditions. And this is the message Satan's going to use 
as uh, um, to deceive them in that 17th chapter. That's real sad, real sad. But that's how it happens. Uh, Carol from um, Georgia. Why do you say that we need the King James Version of the Bible? I have been told to read the NIV Version because it is the most accurate tra translation of the Bible. Do you have spiritual proof to back why you recommend using the King James Version? Not one place, I'll tell you, okay? Isaiah chapter 14 uh, states very clearly, O Lucifer, son of the morning. NIV doesn't tell you that that bright morning star is Lucifer. It drops his name where you don't know if it's the true Christ or the false. And you would believe it if somebody told you that was the best translated. It's garbage. Okay. Pure garbage that would mislead people. Okay. Maybe garbage is a strong word for it, but it's true. Anytime, I, I am very set and fixed and focused because the King James gives the English reader the opportunity to break the Bible back into Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, whereby you know what you're talking about. That's very important. That's what knowledge is, is being able to understand the Word of God. I do not recommend the NIV. I recommend the King James with, along with Strong's Concordance, whereby you can do your own translating easily. I'm out of time. I love you all. God loves you because you enjoy studying that word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You make his day. He makes yours. Brought to you by tith your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But now you listen to me. Most important thing, you stay in his word every day in his word. It's a good day. You know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.